I, I gotta say, I'm a little nervous about doing this because I did this one time before. A few years ago, I interviewed David Chase, the uh, creator of The Sopranos. Uh, and I'm a big fan, and uh, I'd never done it before. And so I wrote down uh, all of the questions I was gonna ask him in chronological order on index cards, exactly <laughs> like this. And we came on stage together after chatting in a very friendly manner backstage, and I dropped the cards, <laughs> and they went everywhere. So now and he's going to use those cards tonight. <laughs> well, that's my first question. Yeah. When you created Tony Soprano, <laughs> did you base him on? Yeah. OK. I thought we'd start off with, uh, with uh, uh, how, how you felt about uh, Reg Presley. Uh, I was blue about that. Reg Presley, for those of you who don't know, was the lead singer of the Trogs. And he sang lead on Wild Thing, which um, is the, one of the most bulletproof songs ever written. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to screw up uh, Wild Thing. And I played in a whole series of bands when I was in college in the 60s. And we all always did, we did Wild Thing because it was an easy song to play. So when the Remainders formed, that was one of the songs we did. And, and we picked as our, um, our two singers for that, Scott Turow and Roy Blunt Jr., um, two of the least musical uh, human beings <laughs> on, the, on the play, except for, except for maybe Matt. Um, and, but, well, you don't probably remember this, but I actually, I hadn't performed. You guys used to go on tour together, yeah. and I, I would avoid that. Yeah. But you came to LA to perform at the LA Times Book Fair uh, at UCLA a few years ago, and I wrote to you and said, Dave, I don't even remember the lyrics to Wild Thing. <laughs> and you wrote back, they're very simple. Wild Thing, you make my heart sing, bing, bing, bong, bing, <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> and I thought, that's pretty funny. So uh, I had a dream. I had a dream that I was on stage at UCLA, and I did not know why I was there. <laughs> right? And then, we, and then the remainders performed, and I went on stage. Can I usually sing back up? And I saw he says wild he sings, things. He doesn't sing. He doesn't sing. <laughs> he stands about four feet behind everybody else singing, and he goes like this. <laughs> but if you go right next to him, he's just going. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. But wait, just to, we did, when we did Wild Thing, the key to the whole thing is um, Scott Turow would say, Wild Thing, I think you moved me, but I want to know for sure. Come on, hold me close. And, and then Roy Blunt Jr. was supposed to go, you move me. <laughs> but he could never figure out when he was supposed to do it. it was, <laughs> And he'd get very anxious, and he would like rush it. You know, he would do it like before we'd started the song. Sometime, you know. <laughs> so, but then we told him that we said, "Bro, you're doing it too soon." So he started doing it too late, because he. And so we we, we just have a bet going in the band whether Roy would be over or under on you move. But my, he also got the lyrics wrong. He got the, the last. He missed you move me. Well, we, uh, the other thing he, he has two lines: "You move me and I love you." Right. Right. So the last time the Remainers ever played, we've been doing this song for 20 years now, 20 years. Roy still had never gotten right. The last chance he gets to do, you move me and I love you. And he's saying, you, you love me. <laughs> 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 and then you can see him go, because he, he knew his chance had now evaporated forever. We'll never do this song. But Reg Presley always got it right. And that's, why, that's what your question was about. Yes. He was the lead singer of the Trogs, and he died at age 71 just recently. Yep. And don't blame yourselves. <laughs> so can we talk about the remainders some more? Sure, sure. Let's talk about the remainders. Uh, how did we get the gig of performing at the opening of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I, I actually was involved in that. I was out on a book tour in Cleveland, and the, the DJ of the morning show I was on was one of the people on the committee that was planning this big party for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame opened. They had a gigantic party where all the, because up to that point, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was actually in New York City, and, and they moved it to Cleveland, because when we think rock and roll, we think Cleveland, don't we? <laughs> um, and so, they, so all the previous un inductees and all, everybody in the whole rock world came to that, to that party, and there was, a, there was a big concert where they all played on Saturday night, but on Friday night, there was a party just for all those performers, and they needed an act to play for all these so they, the, the reasoning was that if they picked a good act, 
everybody in the audience being professional musicians would feel kind of either slighted that they weren't picked or obligated to pay attention <laughs> instead of just getting hammered, which is what they really wanted to do. Then we'll put the remainders up there. So we went up and, and we performed, and I'll never forget, on, when I walked in, we're like, we're looking around and I'm walking along with my guitar um, because at the time I was the lead guitar player <laughs> for the Rock Bottom Rainers and I bang into this tall fellow and I go, excuse me, it's okay. And I look at this, it was Steve Cropper, who's a really good guitar player. And then our <laughs> opening song was um, Stand By Me, which Stephen King sings. And in the front row was Ben E. King. <laughs> who really sang. So it was like a scary, a scary night for us. But fortunately, they got it. They figured out, oh, they suck. We don't have to worry about this band. You know, well, I remember the next day we got a, t a tour of the museum. Yeah. And we watched some films. And Stephen King was, was singing along. And people were saying, shh, this is <laughs> rock and roll. Come on. Yeah. And also, I remember, too, you guys, um, at one point in the afternoon, you guys, you disappeared. I said, where, where did uh, Dave Barry go? Where'd Stephen King? I said, oh, they went off to buy uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame souvenirs. Do you and remember? I said, and I said, well, well, there's a gift shop right here. No, no, they don't want, they don't want to use, they don't have a gift shop. There's cheaper ones about <laughs> six blocks away. But no, and wait. Okay, do you remember? Do you remember? I, yeah, so I'm okay. going to tell the story. Uh, okay, so okay, okay, okay. I okay. ran down the side street, and Cleveland is pretty empty out, yeah. outside yeah. of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. And Even inside a little bit. And there was yeah. this de deserted souvenir t-shirt shop, and I go in there, and Stephen King and Dave Barry are in there, and the souvenir guy uh, looks up, the guy who owns the shop, and... Stephen and, and Dave say, oh my God, look who's here. It's Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons. And the guy goes, oh my God, this is incredible. I can't believe it. In the same day, I meet George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and that's who they said they were. No, no, no. It, he, he the, the guy, when Stephen King walked in, Oh, okay. See, See, that was before I arrived. You, but you were not there yet. We told him you were George Lucas because when we got well, there. I was. <laughs> no. No, no you were George Lucas. Well, who were you then? I was me. All right, all right. But wait, but, there's more. But no, we, we, we go into this, this t-shirt shop, and it's like empty, and it's me and Stephen King. And the guy looks at Stephen, and he goes, you're Steven Spielberg. <laughs> oh. and, and Stephen says, no, I'm not. People tell me that all the time. And he said to me, they do. People, they don't know my name is Stephen, and they know I'm somebody, but they don't they think I'm Steven Spielberg. And I go, yeah, you know, you are. No, 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 I, I know it's you. I know it's you. So, he made, so the whole staff has to get pictures taken with Stephen King as Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and then, then they figure out that it's actually Stephen King. And, oh. and they had to get pictures taken again. <laughs> <laughs> and so then he looks at me, the guy who decided Stephen was Steven Spielberg. And now, having figured out Stephen Stephen King decides that I might be George Lucas. Right. I don't look at anything like, and I go, I'm not, I'm not, George, I swear to you, I'm not George Lucas. And he goes, I better not find out you were in town. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more. That's, that's, that's when there's you, more. That's, that's when, when I you came walked in. in. That's yes. when I came in. So yeah. you did your thing. Then Lou Demette, yes. right? Is that how you pronounce yeah. his yeah. name? It's, Amy Tan's uh, Amy husband, Tan's husband yeah. comes in. Yeah. And they go, oh my God, it's Robert De Niro. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He looks nothing like Robert De Niro, and the guy believed it. Well, well on that same trip, Stephen King took us. To, he, he's a big baseball fan, and at the time, he had uh, season tickets to the Cleveland Indians. Why? I don't know, but he did. <laughs> Great seats, um, right? You know, a couple rows behind home plate. So we're sitting there. Uh, I'm, I'm there. Stephen's there. A couple other people, and then in comes this, this group of people in front of us, and then two rows ahead of us, in comes Meredith Baxter Burney. All right. The woman in front of us is very excited because she recognizes Meredith Baxter Burney. She's going to get her autograph, but she doesn't have a pen. So she turns around and says, can I borrow a pen? And Stephen King says, sure, and hands her the pen. She gets Meredith Baxter Burney's autograph and hands the pen back to Stephen King, <laughs> never knowing who it was. Was that on that same trip? Same trip, I think. OK, so I was, I was in the crowd. the crowd. We were jammed in, trying to get in. To watch the concert. Watch the concert, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and completely could not move. Right. And the guy next to me uh, says, who is that guy? Pointing to Stephen King. I, the guy's famous. Who is he? Who is he? I go, I, I don't know. Goes, yeah, you were, talk you were talking to him. I, go, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Come on, tell me. And then we get into a whispering conversation in this giant crowd. He goes, come on, just tell me. Just tell, I want to, just tell me. And this went on for 15 minutes. 
And finally I said, it's Stephen King. He goes, hey everybody, it's Stephen King, it's Stephen King. <laughs> Well, when, so that's what I think of Cleveland. When the, <laughs> when the Remainers used to play in Miami, Stephen would sometimes come down, and one night after we, we played or whatever, I was driving Stephen and Amy Tan back to their hotel, which was near my house, and they both had to go to a drugstore. It's like 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. It's late, but it's an all-night drugstore near my house. So we go in there, and they're you know, getting whatever they need to get, and I'm just sort of standing there, and this couple come in, and the guy looks at Stephen and goes, that's the king. She goes, really? Yes, look at that, Stephen King. You know, Stephen's always buying nasal spray or something. Right? <laughs> and finally she goes, what the fuck would Stephen King be doing here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you're right. And they leave. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> so re we'll get back to the remainders. Remainers, yeah. We, we, that was just one trip. <laughs> and then we went to, yeah, anyway. What was it like growing up in a monk? Armonk. 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 What is it? A-R-M-O-N-K. In, in New York. It's in Westchester County, New York. The, it's an Indian name, meaning fishing place between the hills. There are no hills there, and there's no fishing place there. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what the Indians were thinking. But um, no, it's just a little town. I had a real normal little town. That what was weird? People always say, "Where did you get your sense of humor?" And I got it from my mother. I had, I, you know, I, this was like, you know, was the '50s when I was growing up. The mayor of uh, Marion Barry. Yes, yeah. my mom's name was Marion Barry, and and with an O. <laughs> <laughs> and she was doing crack way before anybody. Was <laughs> no, she wasn't, but. She would have, probably. Uh, but anyway, she was an unusual mom. Uh, and, you know, she had four kids, or four of us, and she was a housewife, which is what you call, I don't know what you call it now, but that's what we called it back then. But she was a very edgy, funny lady. I mean, she didn't take anything seriously. Like, when we would go swimming, she, you know, my, my sister and I would be going off, there's a lake near our house, and she'd open up the window of the kitchen and go, don't drown, kids, you know? <laughs> and we go, we won't. But we, we would go to... Armonk is this little village, and you know, the, you'd go to the, you know, the Versetti Market and the Butch, you know, Louis the Cleaner and whatever, go around and do the errands. And, you know, we, she would take us along with her. We'd drive it in the station wagon. It was the 50s. It was the 50s. But I remember we'd, we'd, you'd go like in the Versetti Market, and the, the, the trades guys, in, they all loved my mom. And like Ray Bersetti would look up from behind the meat, you know, the meat counter and go, How you doing, Marion? And she'd go, Just shitty, Ray. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and all these heads would spit around for all the other moms, you know? <laughs> But she, she, was, she was like very, now this is gonna, this is gonna sound like a, um, I mean, maybe it would be, to sound weird, but this is, this is the example of my mom's sense of humor. When my father died, okay, so it was like a really bad time. My father died, my, there was four of us, and my, the kids and my mom, you know, we had cremated him, we had him in this like box, and we took him to the graveyard to bury him. You know, we just, just the, four, just the you know, my mom and the four kids. Baron, so it's like raining and it's a sad time and we're all crying and you know and talking about dad. And we put a box in and covered up with dirt. And we're walking away. I have my mom on, on my arm. You know, we're walking. And she starts to read the gravestones and she goes, "So that's why we don't see him anymore." <laughs> <laughs> well, that was wow. her. Like she couldn't. You know, if there was a joke to be made, she was going to make it. You know, so, <laughs> people say, "Where where'd you get your sense of humor?" You know, and it wasn't until much later I realized that she was sort of abnormal. You know. <laughs> Did she appreciate you? Um, yeah, I think so. You know, we, we, in our family, that's kind of how you got approval. You right. know, uh, and I was not an athlete or anything like that. You know, so I was. Were a wise you funny ass. as a kid? Well, I think so. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, I was kind of yeah, I was kind of a wise ass, but yeah, I was a funny kid. Um, it's I, all I ever, it was. I don't know about you, but like when you're when you're young, you use humor basically to to make make people like you, but also to keep the larger, hairier boys from beating you up or holding you upside down over the toilet, you know. So I learned to be funny and entertaining for my classmates so they wouldn't hurt me. But the wrong joke does get that. Yeah, you, anyway. you, don't, you, know, you don't make fun of a Joey Maglio, for example. <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, and you started writing in high school? You write for the school, yeah, I wrote, school paper? Yeah, I wrote for the high school paper and I wrote for the college, my college newspaper, Haverford College in Pennsylvania. And I wrote a, lot, you know, I wrote a humor column, which I thought was hilarious. And then like, oh, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago, I went to a reunion there. And they, you know, by then I was well known as a humor. And they had gotten all my old columns and blown them up <laughs> and put them around the gym, you know. And I go around reading them and they're like horrible. <laughs> like, like, like they're, you're like something you might read to a widow to console her. They were just, 
they weren't really that funny, or I didn't get them anymore, you know, so. That was well, they're all on the internet now, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> for everybody to read. Yeah. And you were in a band, you alluded to being in bands, you were in a band called the Federal Duck. I was in the Federal Duck, we got our name, the Federal Duck, and we played a lot when I was in Harvard, it's kind of how I m earned money in, in, in college, in the, the Delaware Valley, uh, playing mixers and frat parties and watching frat boys throw up on each other. And, but. We got our name at Haverford College. There was a duck pond, and one night we were all the the people who were in the band were sitting by the duck pond, and all the ducks all of a sudden came out of the pond and started marching toward us, and it it was like terrifying. And Bob Stern, our bass player, said it occurred to maybe that they were like working for the government in some way. <laughs> and if, if you don't know why we would have think that, then you don't know anything about the '60s. <laughs> that's, um, but that's when we came up with the idea of the federal duck. Um, we made an album, which is really <laughs> terrible. Yeah, really bad. Wow. But a few people, I still every now and then see it. It's, it's just so pretentious and bad. <laughs> but it's out there. It's out there. No, not really. I don't <laughs> think you can get it, but. Did you write songs? No, we did, all, all we did was, we did Wild Thing, you know? We did, <laughs> and we did Louie Louie, which is the same chords as Wild Thing. In fact, Louie Louie, I, that's the, the, my, that was a song that you could do, because really we were playing like a combat zone situation sometimes. I mean. The frat parties, like at Villanova or Penn or whatever, would be, they would get out of hand. There'd be fights and the police would come. And you know, we just kept playing. You know, as, usually in a band, you have your amps behind you, but we had them in front of us, like a barrier, you know? <laughs> and there were always guys who wanted to come over and sing and play our instruments and stuff like that. But we were playing at a, a, a fraternity at, at, at University of Pennsylvania. And it was at this old fraternity house with this big bay window with a, 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 a porch out the front with a sofa on it. And we're playing Louie Louie which is a, you know, a very safe bulletproof song. And in the middle of Louie Louie, a sofa, the sofa came through the, you know, an arrival fraternity came, and just picked it up and threw it through the, it's like glass flowing everywhere. And we just kept right on playing Louie Louie. It's, like, it's a song, if there's ever a nuclear war, that's the, survive, that's the song we can still play, you know. Did you know where you wanted to be a writer then? Kind of. Uh, if, you know, if you'd asked me what would be the best job you can imagine, I would have said, you know, sit around and write jokes. But it never occurred to me that I could actually do that for a living. So I, I wrote humor whenever I could, but I, I was always thinking about journalism. And I, you know, I, I worked summers at Congressional Quarterly as an intern, and then I got a job in a newspaper when I got out of college. Where did Burger Associates fit in? <laughs> wow, you really know a lot of stuff about it. Wikipedia. <laughs> it's amazing. This afternoon. I, I worked in this in, for a while for this newspaper called The Daily Local News, which was a little paper in Pennsylvania, which actually ran a headline um, once. This will give you an idea of our editing standards. Woman beats off would-be rapist. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, and I went from there to the Associated Press in Philadelphia. <laughs> And I hated the Associated Press. It was like the word army. Uh, like, you know, you, one person could get up and another one sit down in the middle of the story and you can, like their idea of real creativity was if you could correctly abbreviate uh, third U.S. District Court of Appeals. You know, that was, yes! <laughs> that was right in AP style, you know, so I hated that. So a friend of mine um, named Buzz Berger, his father, Bob Berger, had a company called Berger Associates, which was just him and another guy. And they taught effective writing seminars to business people. And while I was really depressed and unhappy at the Associated Press, his partner got real sick and he needed to replace him. So he, he, Buzz called me up and said, would you come work for my dad? And I didn't even know what it was and I said, yeah. And I, so I quit journalism and became an effective writing seminar teacher and I would go around the country. This is what I did for like the next seven years. I went around the country and I would go to like, you know, DuPont or, uh, you, you know, big companies like that and I would get 32 people. They'd be like engineers or accountants or computer programmers, people who didn't, think of themselves as writers, but I had to write a lot of reports. And I would, you know, I would tell them, you know, don't start your memo enclosed, please find the enclosed enclosure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know give them, I would give them good, wisdom good. like yeah. that about writing. Not that they followed any of it, because it turns out, I mean, my, my whole point was you should write clearly, and then it, what, later on I realized that a lot of times they had nothing to say, you know. So they really, that was the point of the report, was to just have a lot of words there. But anyway, I did that for seven years, um, traveled around the country, but I was completely out of journalism. But in a way, it was good for me, because that's when I really started writing a full-time weekly humor column, where I didn't think of it as my job. I got paid $22.50 a week to do it. 
And that's all I thought I would ever make doing it. And I would send it into the daily local news, and they would print it. You know, once. And that's that's how I really got. That's how I really got started. Oh, I'm so disappointed that Burger Associates had Didn't, nothing to do with burgers. Nothing to do with burgers. No. <laughs> I, you know, could, there's I a, could come up with a different story if you'd like, because that one was just all lies. There, <laughs> no, no, that was true. That was true. There's a place in Toronto called the Donut Tree, right? It's, I believe you. Yes. <laughs> and I just thought, you don't think of donuts as on Don Tree in a tree. But no, then it's, I saw it's uh, kind of like truck. Dr dress barn, you know? Yeah. <laughs> there's a store. Who thought of that? Is, that's not a good idea. No. It could be <laughs> dress tree would be better. Donut <laughs> barn would be better. But don't you think? Yes. Or just donuts. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's it. That's it. That's it? On the card? Yeah, OK. Teaching business. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quickly. So you moved to Miami I did. in 1986. Moved to Miami in 1986 from the United States, as I like to say. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, that was a big adjustment. Um, I don't know if you've been to Miami. It's it, when when I first. I mean, the you. I know you've been to Miami, but it's like very diverse place, and and the diversity shows up in many different ways. The main one being how people drive there. When I first got there, I thought everybody, no, you know, nobody here knows the law, and I now realize everybody in Miami is driving according to the law of his or her individual country of origin. You know. <laughs> So there are many interpretations of when you should use a, a turn signal. Some people believe you should just put it on first thing in the morning, you know. <laughs> and, and it's likewise, you know, the, what a yellow light might mean. There also like, there didn't seem there was a lot of sidewalks, at least in the. Well, sort of people just drive on them. People, you know, they <laughs> there better were to get them out of there. Indentations and like I thought it was so that. You didn't need them, you know, because people well, were driving off the road. People no? do drive. This, this is really true. Miami, there's more accidents in Miami involving cars driving into buildings than anywhere you've ever, <laughs> and, in, and not buildings that just sprang up at the last minute. I mean, <laughs> but it's on the news every night, like there's a car in a building. I'm not kidding you. Or in a swimming pool. That's the other option. Um, and it's usually a 78-year-old person in an Oldsmobile, you know. Um, and, they, they, and they always say, the, the, the TV guy always says, the driver told police he thought his foot was on the brake when, in fact, it was on the accelerator, you know? <laughs> yeah, which is a mistake we've all made. But how long does it take you to figure it out? You know, <laughs> you have to wait till you're in the salad bar. You know, <laughs> this is—I want to tell this is absolutely true. Google this if you don't believe me. Uh, three years ago, Miami police stopped a 73-year-old man driving a Chevrolet Cobalt, which is not in itself unusual. It's where they stopped them. Runway 9, Miami International Airport. <laughs> the man, without realizing it, burst through a perimeter gate and was on the runway. You know, I don't know about you, but if, if I'm driving and I see I'm in the same lane as a 757, <laughs> then, oh, I'm, I'm not on the expressway anymore here, you know? And, he's, I, and I can't, I, that's my airport. I cannot get near a, a plane there with shampoo, you know? And he's out there with a the cobalt. So. And you, on your lawn, you have crabs. Uh, not now, but when I first moved to Miami, I lived right next to a canal. And like the second day there, um, I went out to get my paper. And I was barefoot. I'm in my pajamas, walk out and to, to get the paper uh, on the lawn. And I looked down, and the lawn is covered with crabs, um, just covered with them. Not, I'm used to crab grass. You know, I've dealt with that. <laughs> but these were actual crabs. You know. It was crab mating season, and they mate. They come out and mate on your lawn, and they're not in a good mood when that's going on. Now they're <laughs> like they're competing for the, and they like they don't like you. They think like you know get away, you know, because like like I'm gonna mate with their woman. You know, like, <laughs> I know they say, I'm not I'm not gonna mate with your your woman's a crab, you know, <laughs> which just pisses them off because it's true, you know. <laughs> anyway, so they're like skittering back in the house, and, and but there's all kinds of wildlife um, in your yard. Um, I had a snake in my office. Um, in my office, not too long ago, um, I was on, on the desk, and I don't know how it got there, but I, I was reaching to get my Diet Coke, and I hear this hiss, and there's this snake right there by the, that going, you know, and I, at the time, estimated its length at about 87 feet. Um, <laughs> but, it was actually a shorter snake. It was about two feet, but, and I'm sure it was harmless, but, you know, like, it was really a, wow, you know, and, and I, I went running out onto the patio to the, to the, um, the, the grill and got the barbecue tongs, you know, <laughs> and came running back and, and grabbed the snake with the, with the tongs. And here's the, t if this ever happens to you, grab the, take the snake near the head of the snake. Because <laughs> I grabbed it near the back of the snake. And it had a lot of room to, you know, ah! and I, I'm mincing out, you know, and dropped it into the pool. It was not a good thing. 
You're, Which, you were mincing? I was really mincing. I was make, <laughs> uh, making a noise like a recently castrated Teletubby is what I was doing. <laughs> no, um, but in, it, there is a problem in Florida with Burmese pythons. Oh, my God. Um, did, have you heard about the python challenge? Yeah, yeah, yes. That's my state. This is why Florida is the weirdest state in the world. Um, we have a problem with Burmese pythons, which are these pythons from Burma, which is where they belong, not here. That's why they're, <laughs> they're called Burmese pythons. Uh, and they get to be very big. They're like, they're like 15, they can be 20 feet long, these huge snakes. And people bring them in as pets to Miami. And the reason is simple. It's these people are idiots. Because <laughs> why would you want, you know. So eventually, they either let them go because they don't want to have a python in their house or the Th snake. That's a logical thing, right? Just let it go. Um, you know, be on your way now. You know, <laughs> I've done all you can, we can for you, you know. Good luck. Uh, stay away from the liberal arts. Just get out there, find a trade, you know. <laughs> but... So the, the, over the decades, these pythons have congregated in the Everglades, which is like Disneyland for pythons. Um, the, the, the perfect environment. Um, they have no natural enemies out there. They eat everything. They can eat alligators. So they're eating up all the natural fauna, and they are reproducing like crazy. And the estimate is there's like uh, somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 of these Burmese pythons. So the state of Florida, here's how we in Florida, you, motto, you can't spell it without duh. <laughs> um, <laughs> how we are dealing with the Python problem is the, the Python challenge, which is, which is being, and it's going on right now, and you should go home from here and look up pythonchallenge.org, because it's funnier than anything that we'll say tonight. Um, but it, it's run by the Florida State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And the, the idea is we're going to bring people in and have a contest, and whoever kills the most pythons will win $1,500. That's got to work. And who, if, well, what could possibly go wrong? And uh, <laughs> whoever kills the longest pythons, $1,000. Now, but, of course, there's some, you know, it's got to have some controls. You must pay a $25 fee, and here's the best part, take an online course. Because <laughs> <laughs> ask any master python hunter how he learned his trade, you know, online is the way to go. <laughs> so... But the thing, the best part is, so we have a th thousand people who have done this. They're out there. And the thing is, and pythonchallenge.org. Uh, That's a lot of people. It's a thousand people, yeah. yeah. They explain in detail how you're supposed to kill the pythons humanely. <laughs> <laughs> you have to kill the python humanely. You can't just cut off the python's head. You know why? The brain keeps working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't know what it's thinking. Like, <laughs> like oh, shit. You know? <laughs> Where's my body? You know, <laughs> this is hurting my self-esteem. So that's 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 inhumane. You have right. to kill the brain of the python. So anyway, the, the, it, as last I saw, a thousand people out there because there are several hundred thousand pythons, thousand people hunting them. The last figure I saw, they have killed a total of forty-one pythons. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that in that period of time, a mother python gave birth to at least three hundred new ones. You know? <laughs> in other words, the pythons are winning. <laughs> the python challenge, you know, we should have challenged something stupider. <laughs> we should have challenged the manatees or something. <laughs> no, we're not going to kill them. <laughs> I wrote a comment. We have a problem. The motorists, motor boaters keep hitting the manatees. Uh, manatees are not the, and I, don't, I mean this in a good way, they're stupid. They're, like, <laughs> they're just not that smart. They, they go very slow and the motor boats hit them. So my proposal, it wasn't accepted, but I, it was to put motors on the manatees. Speed them up. <laughs> You know, they get up to like 60, 70 miles an hour, and then they, they can compete with the motor boaters, you know. But so far, nobody's done that. It makes more sense than the Python challenge, don't you think? So you said one of the best things I've ever heard about uh, humor. You, you, and I quote, you don't let the reader see it coming, you hit the reader with it, and then you get out of there and go on to something else the reader doesn't see coming. That's it. Yeah. OK, next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know like you probably get many things submitted to you by people who want to write humor. I know I do. You know, and the biggest flaw most of it has is, not to put too fine a point on it, it's not that funny. <laughs> but usually because you can sort of see what they're, you know, and then if they make a joke, ten, you know, then they get, you see the same joke again, and then again, and then again. And that's just that, that. Never mind. Go on. <laughs> so how do you handle that? Oh, I don't, you know. You don't way, accept. The same you way you do. You don't. You don't look no, at I mean, I, I try to be nice. I just thought, you know, m my feeling about people who want to write is that you really aren't going to get. Uh, there, there are people. There are obviously some writers out okay. there. Okay. Right? So yes. What, what advice do you have for them? Well, you know, the same advice 
you took an eye. You just keep doing it until somebody, th you know, likes it and thinks My it's good. My parents enough. were not encouraging. They, they said, uh, you're never going to, first of all, I have to get to this. My parents were huge fans of yours. Well, there you go. They're, you know, and I moved to L.A., and you were writing in the early 80s, and my parents used to send me your column. And my, my dad was, in particular, he would read you in the Oregonian. Yeah. And also in the Beaverton Valley Tribune, I think. And he would compare the columns because the Oregonian censored you. All the time. And he would, he would circle the words that they had taken out in the other <laughs> column. And then he would say, why can't you be this funny? Well, as I was telling you, why can't you? <laughs> no. What? I, I was telling Matt backstage, but, but um, the Portland Oregonian did. They censored me all the time in just stupid little way, annoying little ways. So I finally wrote an entire column, the whole point of which was that instead of the word Oregonian, I, I, I used the word Oregonian instead of the word penis. <laughs> and, and, and it was revenge. Then they stopped, they stopped censoring me quite so much. You know, they, <laughs> yeah, so that my, uh, my parents, uh, they were very, uh, they thought they were being very encouraging. They told me I couldn't draw. <laughs> you know? My dad gave me a book. Uh, well, at what point did they say, oh, you really do have some talent? Well, when I... I Bought them a house? I, you, know, I, <laughs> you know, I got the show. I got, the, you know, The Simpsons. They, that and, was okay with well, that? Well, be, no, before that, it was on the Tracy Ullman show, and I yep. said, you know, the show, and I didn't tell them that I named the characters after them. Oh, right? oh. Which is the best revenge, I'll tell you. <laughs> and the thing is, they, say, they said, you know, aren't you, aren't you uh, happy that you followed our advice and did exactly what we told you to do? <laughs> and look how things turned out. And what did you say? I said, no, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> You told me to drop out of school, go to a community, co community college, learn a trade so I'd have something to fall back on. You said that I should learn how to run a lathe. <laughs> and my mother said, you know you've always been clumsy. You, you'd slice your hands off. <laughs> so so, so yes. they started cutting you down as a lathe operator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they they uh, they had to acknowledge finally that yeah yeah that uh, show. yes. Did you hey, like, so who influenced you? Well, as a humor writer. Well, I'm, no. When I was a kid, um, my da nobody's ever heard of this person. Robert Benchley was a great. Hey. Oh, somebody, hey. My dad was a big fan of Robert Benchley. He had all his books, and you know, by the time I started reading him, it was like the late. 50s, and Robert Benchley had been dead for a while, and even then his humor was considered, you know, dated, but I thought it was the most, I started reading his books, maybe it was like 10 or 12 years old, I don't remember, and just thought it was unbelievably funny, read them and read them and read them, and thought, that's what I want to do, I want to write silly humor like that, that doesn't have a point to it, you know, just silly. So, that was my main, that was my big influence. And, and, and you, of course. And, cur and currently, who do you like? Well, you. Well, no, no, no. Carl Hyacin? Yeah, I like Carl a lot. Um, he writes kind of like the, he's the masterpiece of the South Florida wacko genre. Um, the yeah. Onion? I love The Onion. The Onion's great. Roy Blunt Jr., Roy Blunt member, Jr. Uh, fellow big, member of the band. Roy Blunt Jr., I think, is the funniest human being on the face of the earth. I agree. Okay. I agree. Go read Roy Blunt Jr., fantastic. Or just stand around him. Yes. <laughs> now, so your columns over the years have generated quite a lot of hate mail. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, talk about the one, one you wrote about telemarketers, or maybe more than one. Oh, I, yeah, this is a while back now when I was getting a, a lot of phone calls at home from the National Telemarketer Association, and, and there was an attempt made, I believe, to, um, to get them to stop calling you at home, and they said no, they had a constitutional right to call you at home even if you didn't want to be called. So I looked up, the, all the, it's a very simple column, I looked up the number of the Telemarketers Association, and I wrote a column saying, you know, they feel that they have a right to call you, and I'm sure they would agree, you have a right to call them. <laughs> and so and the, I kind of almost forgot about the column, and then, then it ran, and, and I started getting all these calls from all over the country from all these news people saying, you realize that they've completely shut down the National Telemarketers Association. <laughs> They're, they're, asking for a, they're asking for a court order, they're asking for, this. so it turns out that they didn't want people calling them <laughs> at all hours. Um, do they still call you? No, they stopped. I don't know if it was because of that column, but I don't, do, they can't, I get, legally. I get, them, I get them here. Do you? Yeah, and I'm on a no call list. 
And they, yeah, they call. Well, I would think. But you, you know what? I have a, I have a, I have, a, I have a little game that I like to play. And I, you know, I, it's easy to enrage them. It's easy to be, you know, to. We can all do that. You can all swear into the phone or you know, scream or whatever. Uh, I like to confuse them slightly. And what I always do is I act very enthusiastic, and then I just, I said, I, I'm very interested. I just have one question: Does it come with butter? <laughs> and <laughs> invariably. <laughs> <laughs> Invariably, they say, butter, or does it come with butter? And then I say, yes, fresh creamery butter. And then they, then they swear at me, and then they hang up. And that, that I think, is victory. Absolutely. <laughs> um, pass it on. <laughs> uh, you did another column about Barry Manilow. Well, or maybe, maybe more than one. Yeah, Barry Man, I, I got in moder I went to a concert um, with, to, to see Barry Manilow. I was forced to do that by my wife. And I also went to, and you, we were just talking about it. I was forced to go see a, con a Justin Bieber concert just recently. Um, what? It's, it's really loud. Tell, tell them how loud. It, when, the, when the audience of the Justin Bieber concert is, uh, it's not the music, it's the, the girl screaming. There's a girl next to me. This is just right in my ear, all night long going, I love you! <laughs> not, not me, he didn't love me. So just, but any, have you noticed anything he does makes them scream? Like, I don't know if he did this move when you watched him. But imagine these are aviator style sunglasses, okay? This move. He stands there for like a minute, just looking out at the crowd, basically saying, Can you believe how cute I am? You know? <laughs> then he goes like this. Did, you, did he do that? Yes. And it just like it's a two-minute act. He didn't have to sing anything. He just take off his glasses. But the one, it was the one I got really in trouble writing about wasn't really Barry Mello. It was Neil Diamond, because I wrote a column in which I suggested that maybe Neil Diamond was not the greatest lyricist who ever lived. <laughs> because I was referring specifically to the song where he sings, um, "I am," I said, "to no one there, and no one heard it all." Not even the chair. <laughs> and, and my feeling about that is like, you know, no shit, Neil. I mean, <laughs> I bet the table didn't pick up on it either because these, <laughs> these are pieces of furniture. So I wrote a column saying that, and it really wasn't the point of the column. That was just sort of a line in the column. And I got, you, you think Salman Rushdie got in trouble. I got, <laughs> I got all this mail from the Neil Diamond people saying, you know, how dare you criticize him? He's a genius. I listened to Heartlight 15 times, Mr. Barry, and it cured my goiter, you know? I, <laughs> I kinda, I kinda. So I wrote another column saying, oh, look, at I really pissed off the Neil Diamond people, and here's some of their letters, you know? And then I got all this mail from people who agreed with me, who were anti-Neil Diamond people, and who wanted to talk about other songs they didn't like. So I wrote a whole other column about songs people don't like, which just set off this avalanche of mail. I got thousands and thousands of letters. I mean, people say Americans uh, don't care about the issues. But, <laughs> <laughs> this is an issue they care about. And I, I ended up writing a whole book about it, the book of bad songs, based just from the Neil, starting from the Neil Diamond thing. What are and, some of the worst? Oh, like Honey, you know, by Bobby Goldsboro, you know. Or I think the song that came in dead last was MacArthur Park. Um, <laughs> um, but there are a lot of songs. But to this day, um, people come up to me and, and complain about songs. They, 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 they go, you know that song about the horse with no name? You know, I hate that song, you know. <laughs> Rich, Rich Jenny had a great, the late comedian, Rich Jenny, had a great line about that. He said, you're in the desert. You got nothing to do. Name the fucking horse. Man. <laughs> you know. you know. See, Rich Jenny, still getting laughs wherever he is. One of my, one of my favorite columns that you wrote was, uh, was uh, you wrote in 2006. No, you wrote in 1990. It was about uh, an exploding whale oh, God, in yeah. Oregon oh, yeah. in 1970. And yes. that was when I was in high school. Yes. And this sperm whale washed up on the Oregon coast and started to stink, and they didn't know how to get rid of it. It's the and greatest you... single thing that ever happened. In, in a, I'm anything, including the Renaissance, was <laughs> yeah, the Oregon State Highway Division was called in to, to get rid of a dead whale, and they decided the way to do it was dynamite. Because it's going to blow it to smithereens, right? right? Well, the plan was that the whale would be little pieces, and they would be eaten by the seagulls and other marine scavengers, you know? It would be a textbook whale disposal, you know? <laughs> but 
you can actually see this on uh, if you go on YouTube. Exploding whale. Exploding whale. It is it's still the, the single funniest thing on YouTube. Like, you you see it like you know you're like the cameras way away and a big crowd showed up to see this because like. That's what you do in Oregon. Well, here they're blowing up a dead whale in Santa Monica tonight. You wouldn't be here, would you, people? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so you. You, know, you hear this, like, you just look at this peaceful scene with it, and then you hear this countdown, and then you hear this explosion, and then, then you hear some people going, yay, and then, then you hear a voice go, oh my God, you know? <laughs> and then a smear appears on the camera lens, you know? <laughs> and you go, completely black, because it's like, I've, and I've talked to people who were there that day, it's like, you would not believe what it was like, just coming down out of the sky, the, <laughs> the rotted insides of a whale, and some of these are like big, Big, huge pieces. The dented cars. I know. Then when he finally gets the camera going again, he's in the parking lot, and you see a car whose entire roof has been caved in by what <laughs> looks like a, a booger the size of a refrigerator. You know? <laughs> and, and there's the thing. The best part is like there's still all this whale on the beach. You know, there's like, <laughs> what there's no longer any of on the beach is seagulls. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, the, the scavengers are gone. You know, they're, they're, like, they're not sticking around, but. That, yes, that was the day that, that was, was your state. That was my state. Oregon's a kind of a weird little bit. Oregon weird. is a weird state. Yeah. Oregon is a weird state. I was in a, an opera there once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. I, I, um, somebody sent me a column. Um, this is the digression. Is that all right? I know this Isn't is Isn't like, it all been? In, not in, yes. No, but somebody sent me a uh, newspaper article about it in the, uh, the, uh, in a, the Albuquerque Zoo. No, the, it was in Denmark, at the zoo in, in Copenhagen, Denmark. These animals called okapi, which are like antelope, killed over and died. And they're applauding the okapi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okapi. Anybody? Wildebeest? Anybody? Uh, yeah. So they figured out that, a, um, that what had killed these animals was an opera, an outdoor opera rehearsal, like three football fields away. It killed the okapi. And so the question that came to mind is, what were three football fields doing in Denmark? No. <laughs> it was like, what I wrote in my column is, like, if opera can do that at long range to these animals, think what it could do to humans at close range, you know? <laughs> Maybe we need to ban opera, you know, because I've never, <laughs> never been a fan of opera. So I got the most hateful hate mail I ever got was in response for the opera people. It's just like, you know, dear Mr. Barry, fuck you, you know? <laughs> um, but the Eugene Oregon Opera Company which had a sense of humor, invited me out to Eugene, Oregon to play the part of the corpse in an opera called Gianni Skiki. <laughs> and so I flew to, it's not easy to get to Eugene from anywhere, really. They just get in a succession of smaller and, and smaller airplanes. The last one, they said, well, we can't fit you and the pilot in that one. <laughs> you're you're going to have to fly that baby yourself. To, to you. So I finally get to Eugene, and, and I... <laughs> and, I, and they made me all up you know, as a corpse, and I'm on the stage, and these, these tenors, these, you know, they, have you ever heard how loud and it's like, it's a lot like a Justin Bieber concert, really, <laughs> just, you know, yelling and anyway, so I was a corpse in an opera. Wow. Yeah. And they didn't take the revenge on you. You just couldn't move. I just couldn't. I, you know, the, the, oh, was, yeah. That's a, what is it like to play a corpse on stage? It's hard. It's much harder than you think, because all you can think about is that you want to you want to scratch something, you know. <laughs> Men don't go along without scratching something anyway, you know. But and the other thing was that, that as it happens, the Dolphins were playing the San Diego Chargers in a playoff game on which I had a bet, and I'm so I'm backstage dressed as a corpse with the stagehands, and we're, they they're watching it because they're not fans of opera, you know. They they have a little TV right off in the wings, and we're all watching, and then they say you got to go on, and it's time for you to go, on. <laughs> and I'm going, but you know it's a really close game, and it's back and forth, and everything. They go, we can keep you posted because the edge of the bed is right next to the. So like I'm lying there like this, and I'd hear the Dolphins kick the field goal, and, like, <laughs> <laughs> and the corpse is not allowed to go, Pss, you know. But. With Steve Martin, you wrote the Oscars in 2003. With Beth Armagita sitting right here, I, I wrote jokes for um, yeah. What what was that like? Um, it was really. Did you have to move to LA? <laughs> yeah, I did. I had to come out to LA a lot to do that. Um, it's called moving here. I didn't move here. Oh, okay. No, but it was, you know, basically, Steve Martin said, um, would you like to, you know, write for the Oscars? And I've never written comedy for anybody else. I've never. Never written uh, any, anything for anybody but me. And, uh, and, he, and he goes, you know, come on out, and you can be one of the writers, and you get tickets to the, uh, you know, your really great seats for the, you know, for your, for, the, for your wife for the show. So my wife is already leaning over going, yes, I'm there. <laughs> and like that night she bought shoes, even though it was like six months away from the show. Um, 
but I was scared. I was terrified of doing of doing this because I don't do that. You know, somebody do write gags for other people, and you know, very self conscious about it. Um, so I came out, and, and it was a fascinating process, which I, you're used to, I know, but I was not. We, they call it the room. You know, you're in a room with. Writers and all the people in the room, they were like that. They were all people who were professional humor writers. That's what they do. And I was just afraid to say anything because I wanted it to be like a really great, hilarious joke or nothing, you know? <laughs> but what I, what I realized was that that's not how it really works. Sometimes somebody has a really great idea just off the top, but usually it's kind of like they have part of an idea. They go, what about this? And it might even sound lame, but, but instead of like mocking it, everybody goes, Okay, and then they try another version, another version, another, and it kind of builds and builds. But every, in other words, people are generous and supportive, which is not really what I pictured, you know. <laughs> but then I realized that the writers kind of can be generous and supportive. You don't say that's not funny. You just you have to pitch something funnier. Yeah, I yeah, guess it. Or you yeah. go, uh huh, which means, <laughs> which means, boy, that sucked, you know. But but I, I after after I got used to it, I liked it. I really liked the people. I, and I realized it's like it's more likely actors who are not generous and supportive of each other. The writers kind of they're not going to get any credit anyway. You know, Steve Martin is the, is going to get credit for whatever gets said. Nobody's going to say, oh, that was so and so's joke. So not that we don't remember who's. <laughs> but, so were you backstage during the Oscars? Yes, and it was fabulous, um, especially the first first time. Um, this is the way Steve Martin likes to do it. Um, he would we we had a room literally. Just, I mean, as soon as he steps behind the curtain, that's where we all were, sitting around, and we have a, you know, a hotline to the guy with the teleprompter. So during the show, we wrote a couple of jokes, rewrote a couple of jokes. That was the year that um, uh, Michael Moore made the speech about, um, made the anti-war speech. And then Steve came back and, and, and said, oh, it's so cute, the Teamsters are helping Michael Moore into the trunk of his limo, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a joke we wrote, you know, right then, you know, back, you know, so it was, it was exciting. It was very cool. And then the other thing is, like, everybody in the world is kind of walking around, you know, you know, you'll walk out there and say, hey, Halle Berry, hi, you know, hi, Halle Berry, you know, not really I would ever talk to Halle Berry, but I <laughs> would stand there and kind of inhale the molecules around her, um, you know. So you did your column for how long? Oh, almost 30 years. 30 years. And you quit. Yeah, I mean, I still write sometimes. I, last summer, I went to the Olympics, and I wrote every day. And I went to the conventions, and I wrote every day. So I still write some. He said defensively. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't write. Um, uh, Would you ever start it up again? No, no, no. I mean, it was great. I liked it. But I felt kind of I wanted to stop doing it when people still would like me to do it rather than wait for them to say, you're still doing that, you know? <laughs> So. I used to get that. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> You're still doing. I used to read that in when I did my comic strip. I used to read. I, well, you just stopped that, right? I, sto I stopped it last too. year. Yes, yes, yes. And it feels good. Okay. Do, but you had to do. Let all, it out, Matt. Let it you out. had to do it once a week, right? Yeah. You were think, thinking about it all week. This is. I, I gotta have. This is psychotherapy for me. Yeah. Because he has a weekly column too. So. That's all you think about. Yes. Yeah, and then you think. And can I just have an experience where I'm not thinking about how I can turn this into a column? Right. And the answer is no. You know, but like, you never missed a deadline. No, no. I was very good at that. Well, that's once incredible. a week isn't that bad. You know, yeah, that's true. What about a daily? Can you imagine? No, I cannot. Can't. You wrote a book called The Complete Guide to Guys. Hey. So, what do women need to know? It's very simple, um, and I don't know why it's so hard for women to accept this, but they they don't accept it. Um, the big difference between men and women, the, and it's the fundamental difference, is and you don't accept it, but it's true. Men are capable of thinking about absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Women cannot do that. Women can never think about nothing. They're always thinking about multiple things. Men can think about nothing for hours on end. If you, <laughs> you were to look at the brains of the men in this audience right now, many of them are just going, mm. <laughs> So you're like a woman and a man sitting together on a sofa for like an hour, and the woman will think, well, should I do this? I don't know about that. Well, what should she say? Don't she have homework? And each thought inspires you know, 10 more thoughts. And, and the man will have like one thought in that whole time. And it'll be like, my balls itch, you know? <laughs> but women don't believe that. And so they create this whole kind of world for us, you know, emotional world that has nothing to do with our actual existence, you know? They look at us just watching TV like, I think, well, I know there's more to him than that. You know? <laughs> no, not really. There isn't, you know? So I really, I would say, lower your standards, ladies. That's, I guess, the. Uh, no, you, I think you might have had the same experience. There is, an, there is an essay on the internet attributed to me called The Differences Between Men and Women. 
and I didn't, I did not, it's humor, but it's, I didn't, I didn't like it, I don't think it's very funny, uh, sexist, dumb, stupid, but it's got my byline on it, and it's all over the place, so I'm saying I didn't write it. So I, I, a guy called me up, a, a reporter, to interview me, he said, so, you wrote this thing about the, and I go, no, I didn't, it's sexist, it's stupid, I don't know why, and he goes, he goes, I wrote it. Oh, yeah. oh! So I killed his article. Yeah, he was going to do an article about it and take credit for it, but I didn't give him the quotes that he needed. But isn't there something attributed to you that you didn't write on the internet? Or well, no? a lot of things. I mean, it, go, it kind of goes both ways. But or what happens to me is, um, like, I wrote a thing once that said 25 things I've learned in 50 years. And it just got kind of mutated, and things got added, and things got subtracted. So it's sort of like something like what I wrote, but... It's not, and, and there's some sandwich shop that reproduced it, and like, you know, it's up on the wall with the menus, like, you know, <laughs> with my name, and, and, but you just can't, you know, you just can't stamp it out, right? You know, I mean, you got way, way worse of a problem with that than I do, was, I mean, people well, appropriating your work. It start, yeah, that started in 1989 when, when uh, the first uh, bootleg uh, Simpsons drawing was uh, uh, Bart Simpson wedged in the ass of an enormous woman, and it said "crack kills," and that was everywhere. <laughs> that that was everywhere. I did not do that. Okay, so Dave Barry's money secrets, like why is there a giant eyeball on the dollar? Why? I have no remember recollection. Okay. Of that. I, crack might have been involved. And now you're a novelist. Yes. You start. This is your fourth novel. Um, well, it's like. The third novel for adults, we would call okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And, and I like one of your earlier novels. I don't know which one. It says, actually a novel <laughs> on the cover. <laughs> That's really, uh, so how do you begin a novel? Well, I, the big difference for me between a novel and a column, with, with the column, is just I don't really care what point it may. I have no point. So it's just you know, set up joke, set up joke, call back to jokes. I'm just writing jokes. And I don't care if I completely change the topic in the middle of the column to something else. I just don't care. I will cheerfully make a joke that makes a point that is completely contrary to what I believe, if it's funny. You know? <laughs> Whereas when I write a novel, the, I start like sometimes months, months before I write anything, just thinking about the story and how will the story work and what, what will people care about you know, long enough to, to, to read it all the way through and what would be a, a uh, satisfactory ending, stuff like that, before I even think about any joke at all. And then, like the, ideally, the humor kind of comes organically out of the, you know, the characters and the situations. But that's not the first thing I worry about. And you also you write you write collaboratively. I, I wrote a series of uh, prequels to Peter Pan um, with Ridley Pearson. Yeah, I did. I don't, um, which got made into a uh, Peter and the Star Catchers. The first one got made into a, a Broadway play, and is about to be made into a and movie. Won Tonys, right? Or? It won five Tony Awards. I keep getting. I didn't win them. You know. Rick Ellis, the guy who wrote Jersey Boys, wrote the play, and it's terrific. And, and um, but I have now been told numerous times that I won a Tony Award, so I'm I'm starting, I'm claiming credit, you know, for a, like makeup. I don't know. I'll just you're not related to Barry, who wrote the, no, it's spelled J M Barry. No, no it's spelled I, different. Yeah. yeah, but then oh. it's, it's supposed to be a movie too. The Peter, the, what the guy who did the Hunger Games is the director of that is supposed to direct Peter and the. Star catchers. He's a big guy, big time guy. Just, Jennifer no. Lawrence. Yes. It's, no. Uh, <laughs> She's the one in what do you call it? She's not a director, right? What? No. What I'm are saying we... who started Hunger Games. Oh. Time. Oh. So, uh, have that... you ever seen the Have you ever seen the 1924 silent version of Peter, Peter Pan? Is... No. It's really good. It's live action, and there's a guy in a dog suit. It's the best guy in a dog suit you'll ever see in a in a movie. Oh, playing Nana. Yeah. Well, we've got. Some oh, so in your now. yeah. So in your in in your prequel, uh, is it all the same characters? No, um, like well, okay. We had pro Captain Hook. We had issue. Okay, Captain Hook, but this is a prequel, so he didn't have his hook yet, and you can't call him Captain Hand, right? <laughs> it would make no sense. So, so we it's not him, just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> we <so, laughs> when we used to go, to, we you know, go around and talk about this book to the schools. And I'd make that joke, you know, I can't call him Captain Hand, so we called him the Black Mustache. And then I'd go on, you know, and that was the name. And then a little boy raised his hand at one school and goes, what did they call him when he was little? <laughs> 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 so that's why we carried a cattle prod when we, <laughs> when we went to the schools. <clears throat> and how many, of, how many of those have you done? Five. five. Ridley and I did five of those Starcatchers books. 
<laughs> what's the capital of Vermont? Montpelier. <laughs> and then with Alan Zweibel. Oh, yeah, I did a book called... That's your last book, right? Yeah. Before the one yeah. we're going to talk about. I did a book about. called Lunatics with Alan Zweibel. You know Alan? Yes. Alan has the world's largest head. Um, <laughs> He does, if, and after you've been on book tour with him for a while, you just stare at him. Like, how, does he, how does he walk around with that, you know? But he, he had this idea, this is why Bell did. He's the, one of the original Saturday Night Live writers, and he's a very funny guy. And he had this idea, we should write a book um, where he's one character and I'm one character, and they're both dads at a soccer game, and they get into a dispute. And his character is like, actually like Alan, a very sweet, nice guy. My character is a complete asshole. You know, it's a terrible... You know, homophobic, racist, just scumbag guy. You're Jeffrey Pecker. That's me. And, um, and the two, they just get into a fight, and then they, um, you know, they don't like each other, but it's just a soccer game, and they're never going to see each other again. Then a series of coincidences bring them together, and before they know it, they have accidentally uh, hijacked a nude cruise ship. <laughs> and, then, and then it gets weird at that point. It gets weird. But the way we wrote that, it was the complete opposite of what I just said about how you know you like to think of the whole story and the arc and all that. We just like it was improvisational novel writing. You're like uh, you know he'd write a chapter and I go, oh yeah, deal with this, you know. <laughs> so a totally revenge plot. You know? Now you also uh, you wrote uh, another multi-author book, Naked Came the Manatee. Oh, long ago, yeah. Now, that was the same kind of thing? Well, that was um, at Tropic Magazine, the Miami Herald Sunday Magazine. And we, we, there's a lot, a lot of South Florida writers, Carl Hyacin and, and uh, Elmore Leonard was down there at the time. So we decided we, we'll write a, a novel where each of us writes a chapter and you, know, you have to just pick up wherever the other guy left off. And I wrote the first chapter. Carl Hyacin wrote the last. Elmore Leonard wrote the second to the last. And all these other South Florida authors... And it, and it seemed like a great idea, except that immediately, like, they started killing each other's characters and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> they didn't take it that seriously. So it's kind of a weird book, but it has three different heads that are supposedly belong to Fidel Castro. <laughs> That's just among the plot elements of the three Castro heads. And there's a manatee, um, and, which becomes like Lassie. When I wrote him, you know, it was stupid manatee named Booger, but Edna Buchanan got hold of him, and he became like a rescue manatee, you know? <laughs> um, so it's just weird, but it got published because it had all these authors, and it, it's actually sold a lot of copies. Some of, the, some of these authors, I never think, wrote a book that sold as many as that. You know? <laughs> weird. And, and back to Lunatics, it's going to be a movie? Well, we're writing a screenplay, and you've gone through this process. Right now, we're writing a screenplay, and so the way that works, and you've all, I'm sure, seen this depicted in, in movies you know, where, and TV shows about how it happens when you sell your book to Hollywood, and then you write the screenplay, and it always starts with how much they love it. And then they say, and then they have notes, you know, and they want to change this, they want to change this, they want to change this, they want to change this. And so you do that, and then you send it to them, and then they, they love it, and they want to change this, and they want to change this. And some, some of the things that they, they want to change, they already changed the other way the first time, you know. And you keep doing it, and ultimately it's going to be like a horse in the Civil War or something, you know. <laughs> we don't know what it's going to be about. But we're, that's where we are now. Okay. You've been, I know you've been through this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's not fun. Yeah. So uh, um, your, your new book. While you're here tonight, Insane City. I have to say before uh, before we go on. So we're in this band together, or we uh, the, just broke up. I, as, as Dave said, when when uh, Ted said the now defunct Rock Line Remainders, and you all applauded. We applaud. You were applauding the defunctness. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so everybody in the band uh, is uh, they're all prolific good writers, and we admitted to each other just backstage that that I'm. At least for me, I'm partway through Joy Luck Club, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's you yeah, know. Yeah, we, we, when we first got in the band, we thought, do we have to read everybody's books? And we kind of got over that, you know. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so in order to do this thing, I read your book. Thank you. And it was hilarious. Thank it you. It was funny, and I act it actually brought tears to my eyes at the end. Well, that's I, good. I, was, was I mean, there's some very moving parts in it too. But I mean, really, I was, I was, uh, I was. You, you, you surprised me. It was well, very good. And it was, no, it's mostly really funny. Okay, so I don't. It's not a tearjerker, but there's. It's very touching at the end. So, where did that book come from? Insane City. Well, part, partly because I love Miami, um, and it's a, a town of great weirdness. And and the other thing is, my son got married about three years ago, and he married a lovely woman. I love her. She's great. But have you ever seen what happens to a woman when she gets married? You know, it's just leading up to it, when she gets um, sucked up in the wedding industrial complex. <laughs> and, you know, 
the caterer and the florist and the, the big bridal magazines and all the checklists of things you're supposed to do and all of this, and then they become more and more and more and more and more wrapped up in that stuff. And the, the florist and the caterer become more and more important. And the groom becomes like this minor appendage <laughs> to the wedding. He's like, boy, you think, is he, you, is he even going to be invited, you know? <laughs> so I, I kind of wanted to talk about that phenomenon, the, um, the, the, the bride having to have the perfect, perfect. It has to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. And, and to hold it in Miami where nothing goes right. You know, things go wrong immediately for the groom. He loses the wedding ring uh, to an orangutan. To an orangutan. Yeah, named Trevor. Named Trevor, yes, that, yes. Which, who was started out as a minor character. In my mind, there was going to be this one scene where Trevor was going to get the wedding ring, and you know, that was going to be funny. But I really liked Trevor, and he became sort of a romantic lead. You know, <laughs> <laughs> He falls in love he with He is surprisingly present yeah, yeah. throughout the novel. Yes, it's, he, it's amazing. He hangs in Once there. he shows up, he's yeah. there. I would, I would like you to play him in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! I I would be honored. I, uh, so anyway, the 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 uh, novel takes place at the Ritz Carlton. Your son's wedding was that? No, uh, I've been to weddings there, but no, no. My son got married in New York because that was much more expensive. It's like we live in Miami. Why the hell would we get married in Miami where everybody lived? So we went to New York to get that. You know, if we'd lived in New York, we would have gone to Miami and gotten married. I got to tell you, I, I really enjoyed this novel. I highly recommend it. And it's got, among other things, uh, a large stripper named uh, LaDawn, Ladon, uh, her bodyguard, Wesley. There's a lot of large guys. In, large people. In, yeah. And, uh, and Cindy. I loved Cindy, the fourth runner up in the Cindy. Miss Hot Amateur Hot Bod, Bod yeah. contest, whatever. She, she started she out as a surprisingly out yeah. of gold. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah she started good. out as a minor character, and she took over. And I think this is the first book in the, in the history of literature that has uh, a character uh, injured, uh, head injury by a flying iPad <laughs> being, being flung. Yeah, yeah, there's a key moment yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't think that's been done before. No, I don't think. Uh, well, how about the pirate ship that shoots chicken nuggets? That's not been done <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> it's a tr it or all that has sense. been it done. All, it, all, yeah. it, it makes sense. I hope that becomes a movie. Oh, yeah, well, it'll be nice. It'll be, It'll be about a horse in the so Civil I War. Think, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, let's, can we take questions from, yeah. uh, from the audience? What are you most proud of? Talk like a pirate day. <laughs> I, I didn't think it up, but I did popularize it. It was guys from Oregon who thought it up. But it's September 19th, and it's... Um, because well, we that, missed it. That's one of their ex-wives' birthdays. That's why. Oh. Wow. Yeah. But I, I wrote a column about it, and it will be my last, you know, long after I'm dead and gone, it will be the only achievement that will, that will still, still, they'll still be So talking. do you observe Talk Like a Pirate Day? Well, I try to, but you discover that the only thing you can really do, like a pirate, is R. <laughs> so there's not a lot you can say beyond the R, you know, so it's probably why there are no pirates around anymore. <laughs> David, do you still get free stuff on airplanes because of your column uh, many years ago about the uh, the flight the flight attendants and the, the rude women on the? And that's been a while, but I, I wrote a yeah I wrote a column. I, I fly a lot, as I'm sure you do, and, and I'm always stunned at how people are uh, treat um, flight attendants. So I wrote a column. It was called "The Avenging Flight Attendant of Doom," <laughs> and boy, did I get a lot of free booze <laughs> from flight attendants for a while after that column appeared. They would just come to my house. <laughs> Hi. Uh, quick question. Uh, about 10 years ago or so, you wrote a column about um, seeing the ballet, I think, with your daughter or something like that. About what? The ballet. Oh, the ballet, the yeah. Ballet. And yeah. I mean, I think physically, I was doubled over in laughter. I was just like, I could not control myself. People were like, what is wrong with you? And I was just wondering if that was actually like something you saw or were you just like making stuff up off the no, top no, of your head? No, no, I took my daughter to see the ballet, um, which was... A little better than Justin Bieber, I guess. But I got in a lot of trouble from the ballet community because I used the word mincing. But how are you going to describe you it? You used it against yourself earlier tonight. When guys come like this, they're mincing around up there. And I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying it's easy to mince like that, you know. I'm saying it's mincing. Flouncing? So, so I got, you know, no, no. <laughs> So I got some angry uh, mail. It was like kind of like the opera people, to be honest. But nobody invited me to be in a ballet. Um, <laughs> thank God. Another Miami native. No, no. Hey. No. Just fire your, just charge your weapon into the air. Sorry. I was wondering if you could talk through the process of the scavenger hunt. 
Oh, the hunt. The, um, every year, uh, the Miami Herald runs a, 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 an event called The Hunt, which um, was invented by me and a couple of other guys um, a few years ago, well, 20 years ago now. But it's basically, this is going to sound so boring, so I'll do this quickly. We think of a big bunch of puzzles in downtown Miami, and people come from all over the country to solve these puzzles, kind of insane puzzles. And uh, this is so boring. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a long, complicated um, process to think all, pick them all up. But what, how long does it take? Oh, like a couple of months um, of just a lot of arguing and, and telling each other how stupid we are. <laughs> and and it, since it can never be the same puzzle from year to year because it's been solved the year before, it's all, we always screw it up somehow, so we get very tense and nervous. Then afterward, we drink a lot of beer. That's Wait, so are there crowds of people oh, in downtown Miami? Thousands and thousands it's of like, people. It's like it's a mad, 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 mad world? Yeah, kind of. One year, we, the solution to the, the, the final solution was, OK, that's not a, good, a bad term. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, we call it the end game. Like, you solve the first part and then the second part. <laughs> and you, you had to run up to um, a, the bum and, and say the word booger. <laughs> And a bum in the bus station. And we had a University of Miami professor playing the bum, and he was sitting in his spot and everything like that. And he was already, and we, you know, we were talking to each other in walkie talkies, we knew it was already. What we didn't realize is about 100 yards before him, there was a real bum <laughs> <laughs> sitting, and, and so who looks up and, you know, in his alcoholic haze and suddenly sees like, the, you know, hundreds of yuppies descending on him, going, <laughs> booger, booger, booger. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a lot of screw-ups like that, <laughs> no matter how much planning we do. Perhaps you turned his life around. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. 360 I degrees. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we turned his life around. Okay. Um, um, Mr. Barry, um, I'm sorry, I have a question for Mike Running. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry. I think. Uh, Matt, it's Julian, the filmmaker from Spain. Nice oh, to yes. Nice to see you again. I, I, I want Horror to, movie, right? Yes, right. You're right. I want to wish you lots of luck with the Oscars and the Maggie Simpson short film. How do you feel with the nomination to the Oscar? It is an honor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, we have a, we, uh, the Simpsons have a, a, a 3D short uh, up for best animated short. Uh, yeah. You have a speech ready? No, no, it'll be if, if oh, this indeed, is not one of the it's, no, it's it'll be David Silverman, uh, the director, who has been there from the but it's in the main day. show. It's not in the the show before the show. <laughs> no, I, yes, I think it is in the main show. Well, I think, you'll be there, right? You'll be there with a tuxedo. I, they're not all. sure if they have a ticket for me. Oh, come on. <laughs> have you ever gone to the Oscars? No. Seriously? No, no, I'm a TV guy. Yeah, but you could go to the Oscars. <laughs> it's really boring. <laughs> it really is. I mean, if you're isn't no it? It's like watching uh, sporting events now. It's more fun and easy to stay at home. And Much more, and there's like long, long breaks where there's nothing going on. You, just you know, and you can't. I guess if you're there, though, you can't say all the horrible, mean things about everybody, right? Yeah, I that think you do it when you're. At they home. used to. If you look at the old pictures when they had it at whatever that hotel was, you know, where they first started. Everybody's drinking and smoking. It's a party, you know? And I think they should go back to that. I don't know. Instead of having everybody facing the same direction, smiling when the camera's on them, which is, you know, every time their name is, just like have a party. Um, could they do that? I don't know. Um, back to Dave. Um, Dave, can you tell us why Florida can't get its act together when it comes to voting in presidential elections? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this is the truth. In this last election, President Obama had declared victory, and Mitt Romney had conceded defeat, and there were still people waiting in line to vote in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> vote for East whom, Coast. you know? Vote for, you know, like, vote for the 2016 election. <laughs> but we, we don't, we're not good at it, and my feeling is we should just give away our 27 electoral votes to somebody who can use them. <laughs> um, Montana, you know, or, or <laughs> Belgium even, you know? Somebody, because we are not worthy of having electoral votes. We cannot hold an election. Nobody knows why. Hi, Dave. Uh, what's your cure for writer's block? <laughs> well, my cure for writer's block is to realize that if I don't think of a joke, I might have to get a job. <laughs> but I don't know that there's any real, I mean, I don't really know that there's any such thing as writer's block. I think what happens is um, people give up, or you know, just the work of trying to think of something new gets tiring and old and they don't want to do it anymore. 
But if you, you know, I, I think if you just do it, eventually something will come, don't you? I mean, do you believe that you I just get stuck? I think the Dave Barry energy, energy bar. bar. That's, like, <laughs> that's like. You could do that. You could do that. Overcome writer's block yeah. with. When I can think of a setup, but no punchline. <laughs> <laughs> that's like. Another question? I think we oh, got yeah. them all. I have a question for actually for both of you. Uh, what's the goofiest thing that a perfect stranger has ever pitched to you as a great idea for a book or a column? Well, people are always saying, I mean, this, I don't know if this, this fits your, your question, but they'll say, you know what would be a great column? And I go, what? And they go, restaurants. <laughs> and then they'll just look at me like this. And I always go, well, yeah, that's a, you know, that's fertile. Um, People say to me, uh, I do the best voices. You should have me on The Simpsons. Listen to my Mr. Burns. <laughs> no. I do point out that we haven't hired anybody new in 23 years, so. <laughs> uh, Maybe a couple more questions? Yeah. And Hi, Dave. Uh, go home. One of my first favorite books of yours is A Brief History of the United States, like years ago. Yep. And uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about how that came about and if you did any research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the premise of the book is that um, history is too hard and that's why kids don't learn it, and so. I, you know, I made some modifications, simple, streamlined it. Like, for example, all the dates are October 8th because, <laughs> because that's my son's birthday, so it's easy to remember. It's like even July 4th falls on October 8th. And then, but the way I did it was my son, he was like, I, know I wrote that book when, when Rob was probably eight, you know, and, and he had a babysitter who was in high school, Jennifer, and she would come over and she'd have her um, history book, and I would borrow it from her and like, just go through the chapters and basically almost take them down verbatim because they were so funny the way they were written. <laughs> like there was an obsession with in every chapter there had to be an accomplishment by a woman or a minority group. It didn't matter what the topic was, you know. So I, so I would write like, and also during this time, many great things were being accomplished by women and minority groups, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. That's how I wrote it. I just, I just basically, you know, churned through a real history book of the era. Um. Oh. How do you avoid getting into trouble with Cubans in Miami? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not easy because my wife is one. Um, my wife is Cuban Jewish, um, Jubans. <laughs> no, really, there are many of them. That's what they call them. They, they didn't come in rafts, they parted the Caribbean. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I've always found it, and I have made jokes about Cubans um, over the years, particularly their concept of time, <laughs> which is, they, the word manana means um, tomorrow, but it also means, never. well, basically never again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I, and I've never gotten really any bad trouble, you know, no rocket grenades fired at me or anything like that. The, the, the Cubans, like, at least as far as I've been able to tell, have a good sense of humor. Or maybe they just know I'm married to one, so they don't. They don't mess with me. This is for both of you, since you're humorists. What are your favorite websites for content curation that you can actually publicly admit to looking to liking? I like The Onion, it was, as you mentioned. Yeah. Well, you know, I just discovered uh, DaveBerry.com. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's really good. He's got a blog full of articles uh, that people, you know, that you, they're, they're almost like your columns. In fact, well, no, I just put up things that people send in links. I don't really, they're not really But I, I wanted you to comment on, because these were things that I just pulled off your, your, your website okay. today. Uh, this is an article that was, uh, uh, either you put it up or Judy, your assistant. Uh, Pubic hair grooming injuries on the rise, researchers find. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess we can address this issue. Um, at, one point, at, at some point, pubic hair became bad. Um, it's like gluten, you know? <laughs> like, 
at some, I don't know what happened with gluten either, but, <laughs> but you could like hold up a bank with it now. You say like, whoa, do what he says. He's got gluten. But, <laughs> but yeah, people are apparently, they're, they're well, how, how do we put it? They're trimming themselves a lot and it's, you know, well, and, well, and here's they're having word, accidents. Here's a word that I learned from this article. We actually found that 3% of all genital urinary injuries, genital urinary, were related to grooming practices. I think the message is, of this is something that general practitioners and urologists should be aware of. That's it. <laughs> I'm glad that we had a chance to share that with the audience. Well, I got one more. Devout Christian claims to have found image of Jesus on the back of a beer case. Yeah, I do, I do have a thing, um, Jesus sightings update, and it's amazing <laughs> how many different ways Jesus shows up in our lives. In, <laughs> Many stains. Stains, his preferred method of revealing himself <laughs> is in the form of stains. Well, this one was found by Fred Truluck, a devout Christian from the town of uh, Bradenton near Sarasota. Yeah, Florida. And uh, he found it, he found a piece of Corona uh, beer. No, I saw it. I saw the picture. Yes. And it's a dead ringer. It, dead but, ringer. But, <laughs> yeah. And he says that even a kindergartner could tell that it was that Jesus. was Jesus, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well I think we've about covered everything we need to cover tonight. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. Matt Groening, thank you, Matt Groening.